I am, um, I'll be talking about Northeast Caucasian or East Caucasian, that's basically the same thing. Uh, a language family with uh, a couple of dozen languages in them. Um, I am not a Caucasologist by training, I am an Indo-Europeanist specializing in Celtic. Uh, but I thought a few years back it would be interesting to look at a completely different language family in which very little comparative work had been done. Also, a different language family in a very different, you could say, sociolinguistic situation because we're dealing in this case with a language family on a very small area on the map, a highly fragmented area on the map uh, where the uh, uh, the idea is that these languages have been around for a very long time uh, and they've been beside one another for a very long time, um, maybe uh, in contrast to Indo-European, which spread across typical spread zones, this might be in the terminology of uh, uh, Joanna Nichols, uh, a residual zone where languages differentiate but always remain in contact, so there's also diffusion with possibly pernicious consequences for reconstruction, as for example claimed by, by Dixon for Australian languages. Um, well, let me very briefly introduce the language family to you, if only in terms of uh, mentioning a lot of names of languages. The Northeast Caucasian language family, also called Nach Dagestanian, uh, consists of a basically two branches, Nach and da Dagestanian. Nach is Chechen, English, and Bats, three languages pretty closely related to one another. All of them north of the main Caucasus mountain range, apart from Bats, which moved over into Georgia, uh, so to the south. Um, and the Dagestanian languages, well, Dagestan is, a, as you probably know, a republic in Russia, uh, about the size of Bavaria but with more than 40 languages being spoken. Um, which falls apart into, into a number of subgroups, and the subgroup I'll be pestering you with is the so-called Avar Andi Dido subgroup, which consists of Avar, which is a big, fairly big language with about three quarters of a million speakers which also functions as a lingua franca or contact language because everybody in Dagestan, especially in the mountainous Dagestan area, will be able to speak Avar beside other Dagestanian languages. So Avar is the only really big language with a quarter of a million speakers and the Andean languages uh, Andi, Achwach, Chamalal, Tindi, Bahwalal, Botlich, Karata, and Godoberi. They're all very small languages, and so are the Taido languages, consisting of a western branch, Tsez, Hinuch, Khwarshi, Ingokhwar, and an eastern branch, Beshta, and Hunzi. Um, talking about size of speaker numbers, the biggest language among the Andean Taido languages is Tsez, which has 10,000 speakers approximately. And the smallest is Hinuch, which is the language of just one village, namely the village of Hinuch, which has 200 speakers. And the others are so somewhere in between. So that's the group, sort of the central Dagestanian group, in the high mountain area bordering on um, Chechnya, which is the western most neighbor, and Georgia in the south. That's the area where you'll find the Andi Daido languages. And if you go further to the south in Dagestan, you enter other languages which also belong to this family, like Lak with about 100,000 speakers, Darhwa with almost half a million, and a large family called the Lesrian family uh, with big languages like Lesri, about half a million speakers, and very small languages um, in that group as well, like uh, Kinalu if it belongs there, or Archi, which are basically the languages of one village each. Um, that's the family. 
Now, when I try to, um, some previous work has been done on the family, but it's not really what you would call following the comparative method, because most of the work that's been done on the family has been descriptive and typological. Um, and there have been some attempts to sort of reconstruct in one go, for example, from the modern languages to proto dagestanian or proto nach or proto nach dagestanian without much attention to intermediate stages, which is slightly problematic because uh, the best guesses as to the date of the proto-language would be between four and 6,000 years ago, which is a hell of a long time. So um, when I tried to work on this language, it was quite interesting to see whether the comparative method would work or not. Well, it works wonderfully. Ausnahmslosigkeit all over the place. Um, those languages are also extremely happy to go through an enormous amount of sound changes. At the same time, and some of them shallow and some of them probably rather deep because they connect more than one branch. Uh, and the complexity uh, resides in the fact that the sound changes, are the, as, as you would know from Indian European probably, the output of one rule is the input of a following rule. So relative chronology of your sound changes is a very important thing to establish. It's also very complex to find out if you know nothing. Uh, so a very lively historical phonology, comparative method works a treat. Um, also these languages in the central area, so the Avar and the Dido, they are morphologically very regular, which is bad for reconstructive purposes, because that will mean if they have undergone lots of sound changes and are morphologically regular, you know there's been an enormous amount of analogical leveling. That's a certainty. Um, what I wanted to pester you with today is, well, not go into all the gory details of the language family, which is completely unknown to most of you, but focus on a few points, basically one point that struck me as an Indo-Europeanist and which I didn't really expect to find coming from an Indo-European background. Uh, and the first point I'd like to make starts from an example based on the Achwach language. Achwach is a language with 5,000 speakers approximately. It belongs to the Andean group. And Achwach is, um, one should distinguish between northern Achwach and southern Achwach. Uh, northern Achwach is spoken in four villages in a pretty remote part of the mountains. Um, not that there are no near villages, but these villages are very difficult to get at because of the nature of the terrain. So basically you reach northern Achwach through a broad valley, and neighboring languages would be high up on the mountains on either side of the valley, and would be out of reach. So you go through the broad valley and then you enter into a, a river valley, because most of these villages would be on, along rivers, where you have four villages. And uh, those four villages, they have no distinguishing features amongst one another. So that they all of them speak the same dialect, which is extremely unusual in the Caucasus. And also, the speakers of those villages have very little contact with people outside of their villages, which also is very unusual in the northeastern Caucasus. Uh, because especially men, traditionally, would travel quite a lot First of all, to get their women, because these societies are generally exogamous. And secondly, because they're usually cattle breeders, and especially men who travel with their herds of sheep or, or cattle, who travel between winter pasture and summer pasture, and sometimes cross mountain ranges, sometimes with the effect that some of them wouldn't return. Um, but so Achwach among Northeast Caucasian is in some respects exceptional. So there's North Achwach, you reach that through a valley, four villages, same dialect, and then you run up against a high mountain wall. If you were to cross that, 
which is pretty difficult to do, especially if you're vertical. Um, if you cross that, you come into the area of southern Achlach. Three villages with three dialects, and they're rather different from one another. The Ratlub, which is closest dialectally to northern Achlach, but is geographically remotest, and Tsianuk and Tsegop, and they live there, those speakers among speakers of Avar. And um, the linguist who, especially, who did an enormous amount of work among the Achwach, uh, both north and south, uh, was uh, a linguist, a Russian, a Soviet linguist called uh, Magomed Bekova. And uh, she uh, traveled widely and did an enormous amount of field work between 1948 and 1959, continued to do so later. And she has written the reference grammar, what is still the reference grammar of, of that particular language. And she states that northern Achwach people look very different from southern Achwach people. Because southern Achwach people, they look like their Avar neighbors. So dark hair, dark eyes. Uh, culturally very diff very similar to our, of our neighbors. And of course, they would all be bilingual, but that's trivial. So all speakers of southern Achwach would be bilingual because they would also speak Avar. Avar and Achwach. Now, northern Achwach, they would also be able to speak Avar, but they look very different, she says. She says, um, there's a preponderance of people with red hair so if you're looking for a reason why a person specializing in Celtic ends up in northern Caucasus, <laughs> there's your answer. It's all to do with hair. So they have red hair, fair skin, light blue eyes. And as she says, Margaret Bekava, their women have a sharp tongue, which is really uncharacteristic for Caucasian speakers, she says. So this is the isolated position of northern Achwach, in Dagestan. Uh, and that expresses itself in some archaisms shown in the Achwach language. I've given you the consonantal system of northern Achwach, which is fairly extensive and also typical of this type of language uh, in the world. Um, I would like to point you especially to the um, difference between long and short consonants, or also better frame, probably not long and short, but uh, simple and intensive, because the long consonants usually have a larger area of occlusion to them. So they're not only longer, but also, you could say, intense, which is pretty stable among those languages. A large amount of consonants in the lateral spectrum. So we have um, six voiceless laterals, uh, short t, long t, glottalized short t, and long glottalized t. And the two um, fricatives t and t, and a similar elaborate system in the uvular range, so k, short, aspirated, k, non-aspirated, long, k, glottalized, and t as the long glottalized. Um, not so long ago, it would be capable. You would be able to to uh, to listen to the news in Avar, and Avar has those consonants as well uh, on Radio Free Europe. So they would sort of repeat news uh, news uh, broadcasts in Avar, and it's particularly those long, intensive, glottalized consonants that jump out of the radio immediately. So. You, you wouldn't need to know, understand a lot of Avar to be able to recognize it in one go because of these consonants, the long intensive ones. Um, the consonants between brackets are suspect of being only present in borrowed words. But if you would take away the brackets, you sort of end up in the proto uh, Eastern Caucasian system of consonants. It just happens to be the case. Now, northern Achwach innovates a bit, so it's very archaic, but it also innovates. 
It innovates in having a reshuffle of sibilance and shibilance. So sibilance being the s type sounds and shibilance being the sh type sounds. So the short sibilance all become shibilance and the long shibilance all become sibilance. That's what they do. Why do they do that? So it only occurs in Avar, northern and southern, sorry, in, in Achwach, in northern and southern, and it occurs in a particular dialect of Avar that is being spoken among the southern Achwach people. So it's likely to be a contact phenomenon, although it's very difficult to decide who started this. Um, but this is not the thing I'm after. Uh, I'm after what's at the top of page two. Um, the particularly unstable sounds in this very large system of consonants are the short affricates. So, tl, k, c, and sh. Uh, but they behave extremely asymmetrically. So the tl and k become fricatives in all Andean languages. In fact, also in Avar and also in the Dido languages. So basically in all languages apart from northern Achwa. Tz becomes a fricative of the type S in all Andean languages, in all Dido languages, and mostly in Avar, but not completely in Avar. Whereas short Ch is retained everywhere apart from the Dido languages. So completely asymmetric treatment of the uh, affricates, the short affricates. Uh, but let's have a look at the two short affricates that in this huge language family in terms of diversity are only retained in northern Akhwa. And that's the short tl and the short k. So I've given you basically the data there. Uh, k becomes uh, k in southern Achwach, but it remains k in uh, northern. Tl becomes tl in southern Achwach, but it remains in northern. Uh, and let's not talk about tz here. Now, if it weren't for northern Achwach, so those four villages with a couple of hundred speakers in them, um, because all the other languages in the family have sl instead of tl. They have ch instead of kr. If it weren't for northern Achwach, we would no doubt reconstruct the sound change from the affricate to the fricative to proto avar on the dido. And it's only because we happen to have northern Achwach that we can't anymore. Um, and this is. I feel one of the typical things here, if you look at Indo-European, the impression you get always is, at least I have, the impression I have is, most of the stuff is gone. Most of the stuff in the dialect continuum is gone. Uh, so it's the equivalent of having, say, the Romance language family as it is today, and the only thing we would, left, we would be left with after 2,000 years is the dialect of Paris, the dialect of Bucharest, and the dialect of Madrid. So no messiness, basically. No continua. And I think it's quite different in the Caucasus. It seems that all these intermediates, or these very many intermediate stages, uh, are still preserved. Uh, now I want to take you through the developments of tl and kr in the Dido languages, but I do so extremely briefly. I've given you the material to read at your leisure if you feel like it, uh, or not feel like it, you can skip it. This is basically my etymological dictionary of those languages in, um, in, in the state of being and becoming. Um, in the Dido languages, the tl has a fairly complex treatment in some languages, so not in all of them. So tl becomes tl, which is basically what happens all over the place in four languages, Tzes, Hinuch, Chwash, and Beshta. I'm now page two, number five. But in the Inchokwa language, there's a pretty complex set of um, correspondences, 
Beginning of the word, the reflex is H. After a vowel, it's L. And after a consonant, it's SL. And the other complex language is HUNZIP, which has SL at the beginning and after consonant, but L after vowel. And that's based on the material I gave you on page two, on page three, and four, and five, and now I'm on page five at the bottom. And at page five at the bottom, I again repeat sort of the situation there. So if you look at what happened to Proto, Avar, Andi, Didi, Dido, Tle, short African, this is what happens in those languages. Now normally you would be inclined if you if you saw a change happening especially across many languages to use that in order to draw up a family tree. So to look for common innovations and then plot them and say and more, or more or less pinpoint when this development happened by looking at which languages took part in it and we use it in order to draw up a family tree. That is pretty difficult in this particular case because there are four languages in which nothing very spectacular happens. You just get sl, the fricative. But there are two of them which do different things, especially Inkokwar and Hunzip. But the isoglosses you can then draw through the family they don't align with any deep uh, distinction between the languages. So the, the deep isogloss, or deep isogloss, uh, uh, the isogloss separating Inghoquar from the rest also separates the village, basically three villages of Inghoquar, from the neighboring village of Hwarsh, which is almost the same language. Almost the same language. And it's the same with Beshta versus Hunzip, they're very closely related to one another. The one has the trivial treatment to sl, and the other has the non-trivial treatment. So you get isoclosses that do not conform to the genetic grouping you might expect. And that I find is slightly unusual. Um, well, anyway, what we can basically say on the basis of um, this reconstruction of the Dido languages is because Inghoquar and Hunzip have a very specific and particular set of correspondences that the short affricate must still have existed in Proto-Dido. So if it was lost earlier, you wouldn't expect it. So there's a unique correspondence set for proto avar andi dido tle in Inghoquar and in Beshta. Sorry, and in Hunzip. It follows from that that the proto language of the Dido language cannot yet have lost tle. It was lost, definitely, but it was lost at a later stage and separately in each individual language. And that's again is something I would normally not be, I would not expect to find very often in Indo European. Of course, it's quite natural that this might happen. Languages doing the same thing in the independently of one another. Uh, but here you can actually pinpoint it that it does happen in this particular case. Sort of the same story that goes a bit quicker for k, the usual. And again, there's a bit of material. And turn a few pages, you end up on page 11. And there the set of correspondences is slightly more difficult, so I've given you a diagram there. But again, it depends on the position in the word and in which particular language you're looking, what this short African will do. Um, the word initial position there's a correspondence set which is unique to k, so no other sound has that correspondence set. Uh, I'll skip the second line of that diagram. After a vowel, again, there's a unique set of correspondences among the languages, which you wouldn't find for any other sound. And after a consonant, there's a non-unique 
set of correspondences because after a consonant, short k behaves like long k and like the fricative k. And I've given you kl in the same type of diagram below that, and now page 11, number 7. So it turns out there's quite a parallel treatment between k and kl in the sense that apparently it looks like this particular sound was preserved longest at the beginning of the word and after the vowel, whereas it was lost perhaps earlier after the consonant. Okay, now I'm almost there. Um, so the first conclusion from all this would be proto-diodo represents the same stage of the development of the short non-ejective affricate, so kruentle, as the modern northern Achwach languages do. The language does. Um, and what I find remarkable then is the second part of the conclusion, having looked at the Dido languages, it isn't the case that Proto Dido then innovated in some sort of way. No, all the individual languages at a certain point, independently of one another, got rid of the short Africans independently of one another, it seems. Does that make sense? Well, perhaps it makes sense because, as I said, all speakers of Dido would also be speakers of Avar, and in Avar the distinction was lost. So if, if sort of Avar phonotactics takes over, you could imagine that there would always be a trigger nearby to get rid of the short Africans. So it sort of makes sense. first consequence on the bottom of page 11 I've already gone through. I'd like to turn the page and that's sort of the last thing I wanted to do. Uh, that I now find it very difficult and again I've, I have the impression that this is symptomatic for this dealing with this particular language family in this particular social linguistic setting that it is very difficult to distinguish chronologically deep isoglosses from recent ones. So what you could imagine happening is um, so think of the Northern Achwach scenario, right? So why is Northern Achwach so conservative as opposed to the rest of the family? Um, well, it could be that Northern Achwach was isolated at a certain point, as it still is, and the other languages were sort of mooring to contact with one another or with Avar, and there was a, a common innovation that got rid of Tle and Kr in the entire family apart from Northern Achwach because it was isolated. But then isolation stopped, and Achwach took part in a whole host of developments that turned the Andean languages into Achwach. That's one possibility. So it would be a deep isogloss, separation not being the first step in the languages moving apart from one another, but separation being just temporary. Just being temporary, and then the next phase, no separation anymore. So that's a possibility. The other possibility this is, is that we're actually looking at a very shallow isogloss. So all Andean languages could have preserved tle and kh up to the 19th century, before Baron Usla came along to, to, to sort of make the first grammars of them. Um, and only relatively recently, all of them got rid of those sounds perhaps under the influence of Avar, who may have started it, apart from Northern Achwach, because Northern Achwach is, and still is, pretty isolated from all the other languages. This apparently is what happened in Dido, where you can actually demonstrate the change to be recent. And I'm disturbed by the fact that in Indo-European, I'd normally have no problem in distinguishing an ancient isogloss from a modern one. I do have this problem in this particular language family. Uh, since I don't want to pitch Indo-European against um, Northeast Caucasian, I want to draw attention to a few uh, Indo-European parallels to both scenarios. Um, there aren't many of them as far as I know. So the first scenario, so deep isogloss, and then unification again across the language area, 
Uh, you get something like that in the um, vulgar Latin, uh, so late antique Latin vowel split. So when the Latin vowel system collapses, you lose the difference between short and long vowels, and they collapse in some sort of way, some sort of pattern. And there's the Eastern Romance pattern and the Western Romance pattern. So Romanian would be Eastern Romance, and French would be Western Romance, for example. Fine. But that isogloss runs across Italy. So there are Italian dialects who have the Eastern type, and there are Italian dialects that have the Western type. That looks to me like a possible parallel for the, the isogloss is old. There was a separation at some point, but that separation was not the starting point for further differentiation. Languages moving apart. But later changes then simply took over the entire area and it didn't really matter that there was a different vowel system in southern Italy as opposed to northern Italy. Both of them became Italian. And something similar could be said for the what I've called Northern Russian here. I mean the uh, the text of the, the Russian, sorry, the Slavic uh, language of the Novgorod Birch Park texts, which uh, fail to go through the second palatalization. But apart from that, look like the pretty normal standard medieval Slavic. Possibility two, so the shallow isogloss. So for some sort of a reason. All these languages held on to the sounds up to a very recent stage and then independently of one another, or seemingly independently of one another, then decided to throw them away. Well, there is a parallel for that in European as well, in terms of the loss of the laryngeal sounds, and almost no language preserves them. And it seems there's a conspiracy that almost right before uh, written attestation starts, they've gotten rid of their laryngeals. Uh, and something similar with the syllabic resonance. So very few languages preserve them, but they all get rid of them in different ways, depending on the subgroup. So we know it from Indo-European, that type of change. Uh, we think it's exceptional. My impression is that in the North Caucasus, this is not exceptional, but quite common. Thank you.